Oops, sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Africa Center at the Atlanta Council. My name is Cameron Hudson. I'm a senior fellow here. Um, on behalf of uh, all of you, welcome uh, and welcome to our guests. Um, is this a selfie? No, no, no. <laughs> I, would, I would have smiled. It's a bimmy. <laughs> Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here for the launch of Democracy Works, Turning Politics to Africa's Advantage, uh, a follow-up to the very excellent Making Africa Work, uh, which I recommend to all of you if you haven't yet uh, gotten a copy of that. Uh, so this series by Dr. Greg Mills, Olesiguno Obasanjo, uh, Tendai Bidi, and uh, Jeff Herbst. Um, copies of the books are available outside if you haven't received them yet. Um, or purchased one yet, because they're for sale. Um, it's a hell of a way to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're delighted to have both of you here to, um, to discuss this, uh, which I know will be a very thoughtful conversation with a great and esteemed audience. Um, before I turn things over to our guests, uh, I just wanted to give a word of welcome from the Atlantic Council. Uh, we were founded a decade ago uh, by National Security Advisor James Jones, General Jones, uh, to promote dynamic partnerships with African states and to work to shape U.S. and European priorities towards strengthening security and promoting economic growth and prosperity on the continent. Uh, within this context, the Atlanta Council's overall program of work to promote constructive U.S. leadership and engagement in international affairs the Africa Center supports and collaborates with the public and private sectors in developing and promoting practical responses to challenges and opportunities facing the continent today. So given this mandate, I think it's hard to think of a more appropriate conversation to be having uh, about Africa than the one that we are, we are here to have. Um, the authors probe, I think, the very fundamental questions of why some countries get stuck why some regress, and why others advance and consolidate uh, their exercises in democracy. And as they explored in their previous book, Africa's population we know will double by 2050, raising all sorts of questions uh, about this demographic shift. What will it mean for democracy? What will it mean for the future of African states? And what can Africans and those of us in the international community supporting these changes uh, do uh, to smooth out these, uh, these demanding uh, changes going on uh, on the continent for this next generation. Given that this conversation today takes place in Washington, I know you've both been on a road show uh, across multiple countries and continents, uh, but because we are in Washington today, I think there's some very interesting questions we can, we can explore about what the international community and specifically the donor community can do to help begin uh, and to continue to promote democratic consolidation uh, across the continent. So I'm anxious to begin the conversation. Uh, just a sort of run of show, we're going to have uh, each presenter give about uh, 10 or so minutes of reflections on the <coughs> subject and the book in general. Afterwards, I'll uh, moderate a short conversation and then bring you all in uh, for a Q&A. And then I'm told that Dr. Mills has arranged uh, a little surprise for us at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the event today. Uh, so that'll be uh, incentive for you to stay in your seats uh, to the end. Um, so with that, let me introduce our, our two panelists um, who have been here before and, and probably need little introduction, so I'll be brief. Uh, Tendai Bidi serves as the Deputy National Chairperson of the Movement for Democratic Change in Zimbabwe. He also serves as a member of parliament representing Harare East District. He's perhaps best known as having served as Minister of Finance of Zimbabwe from 2009 to 2013, during which time he led significant reform projects to stabilize the country during a period of hyperinflation. He has Washington roots as well, having formerly served as a visiting fellow at the Center for Global Development here in Washington, focusing on fragile states, debt management, and economic recovery. Tendai, it's a great honor to have you with us today. Uh, Dr. Greg Mills serves as the director of the Brent Hurst Foundation, a Johannesburg-based think tank aimed at strengthening Africa's economic growth and development. Previously, he served as the national director of the South African Institute of International Affairs. 
Dr. Mills is the author of several books, including Why Africa is Poor and the aforementioned Making Africa Work. He's also advised several African presidents on economic growth and development strategies. Greg, let me turn it over to you for opening reflections. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Cameron, for the, uh, for the organization and to James and, and others. Bronwyn, I'm sorry that uh, Peter Pham is not here, uh, but I hope that you will pass on our thanks uh, and gratitude to him uh, for hosting us at the Atlantic Council. Um, you're right, we've been on a road show uh, for a little while on this book. We were in uh, London a week or so back. But last week I spent uh, at racing at the Lamar 24 hour. So this week is a slight change of gear, if you excuse the motoric metaphor, back down to the reality <coughs> of, uh, I used to think more difficult things of trying to get countries to do the right thing by their people. But having uh, done Lamar, I think it's probably easier to try and uh, fix small countries than try and race motor cars there. Um, let me talk about why we wrote this book a little bit uh, and talk a little bit about some of the findings before I hand over to Tendai and then we can turn it into something of a discussion. I, I think you touched on it, uh, Cameron. The, 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 this book is really a follow-up to Making Africa Work. And essentially, Making Africa Work looked at the economic challenges facing the continent to try to draw on the experience that we've had in working in advisory groups across Africa, including uh, some people in this room and some of those advisory groups, uh, in trying to develop policy to, which would ensure greater diversification uh, across the continent. A and we, we do this against the backdrop of tremendous demographic change. Uh, we were I was talking to Abdul early about um, the general rule in Africa, which is that between independence and 2050, that most countries are going to increase their populations tenfold, or projected to increase their populations tenfold, except for one, Niger, which is going to increase its population by more than a factor of 20 uh, uh, over those uh, nearly uh, those nearly 100 years. Uh, but this is an indicator of how large this big this demographic change is, the doubling of populations uh, across Africa to number well over 2 billion by 2050 demands a rethinking of the way in which we do things across the continent. It demands, in simple terms, an end to business as usual. Um, so this drove the, the, the analysis which underpinned making Africa work. And essentially, this is the second part of that argument, which looks at the relationship between democracy and development. And that is my second point, is that democracy has a much better record uh, of development in Africa uh, than authoritarian systems. There are exceptions to this rule, uh, but you will, when you read the book, you will see that we've disaggregated uh, the last 25 years of African economic history and show very clearly uh, that the more open the systems of government, uh, the higher the rates of economic growth, and the less prone countries are to periods of volatility. And this really is not, it shouldn't really be news. It's because, on average, the more open the country, the better the systems uh, of governance, the better the systems, uh, the better legal framework, uh, and the, better the, the less the corruption uh, if you take a range of international indicators. So being more democratic is, of course, better for development. Of course, there are countervailing examples, um, as I've already intimated. And Rwanda and Ethiopia are perhaps the most uh, uh, notable among these. The book spends a lot of time talking about whether authoritarianism offers an alternative to Africa. Of course, historically, it hasn't. Authoritarians and, uh, have, in fact, done things worse uh, than even Democrats have done them, um, has led to a worse development performance across Africa. Uh, and then we spend some time looking at international examples uh, as, an, uh, as an alternative to the prevailing democracy works example, which we adopt. In particular, we, s we spent a lot of time looking at Singapore, because that's often cited. I spent uh, a, a year as advisor to Paul Kagame, uh, and was often cited in the case of Rwanda as a model that the Rwandans wish to follow. And it's very important that we don't take the wrong lessons, we argue in the book, out of Singapore, 
it was much more, and its success has been much more than just about tough leadership. It's about attention to detail, uh, and there, there historically have been high levels of argument on key issues in government uh, and all the way through government. One of the 300 or so interviews that we did in this book, or for this book, was in fact with Go Chok Tong, uh, where we spent an afternoon with him talking about the areas of difference that he had with Lee Kuan Yew. It's very hard to imagine that uh, happening in an African context, even in a democratic one. And of course, Singapore focused laser-like on implementation, which is a big difference. We spent, I spent, interviewed uh, Haile Miriam twice for this book when he was Prime Minister and Abiy uh, following that. It's clear that in Ethiopia that authoritarianism, although it was cited as an example of authoritarian growth, that it's not proven enough. It's failed to address the internal contradictions uh, which are present in Ethiopia, including, including that of political exclusion. Uh, and this has also had an economic cost too in terms of its isolation from international markets. And we argue finally in terms of the authoritarian alternative argument that Rwanda is a very special case. It can't be unlikely to be replicated in Africa given the history of gen genocide. And the risk is that if you try to replicate it, you won't get a Kagame if you regard him as being a good thing, uh, uh, but you'd rather get an old style uh, authoritarian. authoritarian. The fourth point we look at is, is um, why there is, and Cameron intimated this again, why there has been stagnation in terms of democratic performance uh, in Africa. From the 1980s till now, uh, there has been a tremendous shift, of course. In the early 1980s, just three countries could be considered as, as, to as free in Africa, and we use Freedom House's classification throughout the book because it is the most consistent and has had the most durability. Um, from three in the early 1980s to 10 countries today which are regarded as falling in the free category. But no, most notably, not only has there been a big shift in that regard, there's been a big shift from the unfree to the partly free category. But since the mid-2000s, it has more or less stalled. Um, the question is why? Uh, and the book spends a lot of time trying to understand why it is that democracies stick what the reasons for stickability are in particular uh, uh, circumstances, and essentially classifies there to be a difference between those which are born free, like South Africa, my own country, or Botswana, or Namibia, for example, and those which enter a stage of democratic transformation. We argue that democracy is not linked to a stage of development. The countries that shift to, f to freedom in Africa are mostly still poor, the, uh, the average per capita income is around $1,500. And this seems to be a counter that you have to be rich to be democracy <coughs> argument or that democracy follows development as an Asia type of argument. In Africa, the advent of democracy is largely also not an elite pact. It is a bottom-up affair. It's driven by populist bottom-up demands, which of co course puts the, the democratic country slightly at odds uh, with um, uh, the, the Chinese model of engagement with Africa, and that may be a source of increasing friction in the years to come. And most countries tend to stick once they have made it, with just two exceptions, uh, Mali and Zambia. So once they've entered into the free ca category, uh, uh, they tend to, with varying levels of performance, stay there, uh, and the questions, of course, are why Zambia and Mali uh, have, have uh, fallen out of that category. Uh, the, my second last point, fifthly, is why are w w we spend a lot of time understanding what is required to make elections work better. Tendai, of course, has had personal experience of this, uh, most recently in July last year. Um, but of course, it's not the only aspect of democracy. It's an important prerequisite, um, uh, but it's important not to overfocus on the election day itself. I think it was Ju Justice Krichler of South Africa who said, only an idiot would rig an election on election day. Well, there's a few idiots out there, uh, naturally. We've seen a few present in, Ma uh, in Malawi recently in the infamous Tipex election. Um, but it's, it, it's really uh, it's an indicator that, uh, uh, that, il that democratic, uh, dem the democracy is much more about a process of institution building it's much more about institutional development 
and the norms and standards uh, which are established to enable uh, the development of that system in the long periods in, in between. It's necessary, we argue too, that Democrats develop a playbook, a playbook to counter authoritarianism, uh, 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 to use digital and other technologies effectively. Some of those technologies are exceptionally analog, uh, both to protect and to gain uh, its share of the vote. It may also be the case that international actors who are interested in promoting democracy, and I would argue in the context of the United States, this is a particularly important tool that the United States has, which differentiates it from other actors across the African continent and ones that are increasingly active, it's very important for them to be seen to be supporting democracy, not only because it's, as I've said already, good for economic and developmental performance and squares with the rights that you profess in this country, uh, but also because it differentiates uh, uh, yourselves from those other actors and it is what the majority of Africans prefer. The work that Afrobarometer has done really underpins a lot of the empirical analysis that we utilize in this book, and their polling regularly shows that two-thirds of Africans prefer democracy to any other system of government. Of course, external actors, including the United States, which we would, I think, I don't know if we agree on this point, uh, at Tendai, but we can talk about it later, we would see slightly on the retreat uh, in terms of the promotion of democracy in Africa. Uh, external actors are going to be no silver bullet, uh, whether these be observers or consultants, but the history shows that they can certainly make a difference. Uh, there's not a large sum of aid delivered for democracy in Africa, it's under 10% of the total, but there is evidence that this type of aid does deliver. Um, it can fall foul, of course, of national and strategic interests, uh, as it has done in the case of Uganda, uh, which we cite as one of the case studies in this book. But it's very important for donors to, to recognize the negative impact of aid in terms of reinforcing authoritarianism. So let me end there uh, with my six points uh, on, on the big challenges that Africa faces. Firstly, the better record of democracy um, uh, in terms of development uh, and the association of the better the democracy and the better the development performance. Uh, and indeed the more diversified the economies generally, uh, the, the limitations of the authoritarian uh, performance through authoritarianism argument as we see it, uh, the understanding of where we are in terms of the number of democracies and why there is stagnation, uh, and fifthly, the importance of elections and the importance of external engagement. Over to you, Tendai. Well, thank you, Greg. And, um uh, it's good to be here in Washington. I want to acknowledge uh, my old friend, Ambassador or Assistant Secretary uh, Johnny Carson. It's good to see you again, sir. I want to uh, acknowledge as well my friend uh, Todd Moss, uh, who is also here. I've known Todd for a long time, uh, and it's, it's a privilege to call you a friend, Todd. I want to say that um, in writing this book, we did so for a number of reasons. The first one is the basic thing that uh, that which we call democracy, that, that those value system of openness and transparency that we've always associated with democracy have become under attack. And that democracy itself has become a contested uh, a, a, a concept. It's contested by populism. It's contested by nationalism. It's contested by the rise and emergence of international terrorism, which has a, a moved uh, and redefined conflict from uh, inter-nation, uh, bilateral nation uh, conflict to small groupings. We have seen the emergence of Al-Shabaab, of Boko Haram, and so forth. So democracy itself uh, has been uh, contested. On the African uh, continent, uh, Africa is huge. Africa is not homogeneous. Uh, there is a narrative that began to emerge 
a very toxic narrative that began to emerge that uh, democracy was a luxury that Africans could not uh, 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 need and did not need. The narrative is not new. It started way back with the likes of uh, Nkwame Nguruma, who argued that Siki, the political kingdom first, and everything else will follow. And that philosophy justified the scepter of one-party states uh, that followed the first decade of African, uh, of African uh, independence. To compound uh, this theory was, of course, the emergence of the Beijing consensus, the theory that uh, you do not require democracy, all you required were big people. I call them little big people because they are big internally, but they are weak e externally. Uh, big men like Ofed Brinye, like Siad Bari, like Joseph Mobutu uh, Seseseko. So there was currency. There was currency in this theory that all that Africa needed was this big man. But this big man brought something, performance legitimacy. So in the case of Ethiopia, you had Mele Zenawi who built huge bridges, huge power stations. In the case of Rwanda, you have an economy that has been growing at an accelerated rate of at least 8% per annum in real terms uh, in the last year. Uh, in the last uh, 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 you know, 10 years. Egypt, too, was thrown in the ba that basket of countries where you didn't need democracy. The experiment under Mos Morsi uh, was, was a disaster. Uh, 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 Gaddafi in Liberia was also used in the, in the negative, that look at Gaddafi under the strongman, and look at Gaddafi, uh, uh, sorry, look at Libya with its experiment uh, with the democracy after the demise of uh, Gaddafi. So we are to make a case that sustainable democracy, we are to make a case that sustainability <laughs> in the context of Africa uh, uh, succeeded in situations where, number one, there was regular free and fair elections. Number two, the population could hold its leadership to account. Three, the market was, uh, was open. And if you go to the first three chapters of the book, we compare the performance of these various countries in their three categories. And we use, as Greg said, the categorization by Freedom House of the free, partly free, and not free uh, countries. There's no doubt that countries like uh, uh, like Botswana, have been doing well uh, on the African country continent. There's no doubt that countries like Mauritius have been doing well on the African continent. Uh, Ghana is a, is a very good example. Between 1966 and 1990, it went through eight different governments, eight military uh, 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 coups. But its growth rate from 1990 to now, where it is had different transitions, uh, from, uh, from President Rawlings uh, to President John Kofu uh, to uh, 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 Dr. Mills Mahana and now uh, 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 President Nana, you can see a huge shift uh, in its uh, uh, you know, development. But why does democracy in those countries that uh, are democratic, why are they doing well? And we make the case based on three things. Number one, you cannot govern a country without the consent of the citizen. That by its very nature, governance requires the consent and the consensus of the citizen. Governance, at the end of the day, is the establishment of a social contract. And so you need a contract, an agreement between those that are governed and those that are wielding uh, political power. So the idea of uh, consensus, the idea of consent, which is at the hallmark of any democracy, is so key. The second issue is the capacity uh, of democracy to manage diversity. Africa is a continent with over a billion uh, 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 people, but it has over 800,000 languages and, and nationalities. So it's a diverse con uh, a continent. In one country alone, in my own country, where I come, Zimbabwe, there are 14 official languages recognized in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Constitution. 
But if you visit other parts of the country, there are languages that we have not heard of, that we have not recognized uh, in the Constitution. So democracy is essential in managing diversity, particularly if it's emboldened by features that you find in modern constitutions, features of uh, decentralization, of devolution, uh, and, and of, uh, uh, of federalism. Uh, thirdly, thirdly, and this is very, uh, this is very uh, 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 key, democracy tends to be self-correcting. Democracy tends to be self-correcting. Uh, but this only happens where the electoral system actually uh, delivers. So where the electoral system actually delivers, it means that those that are holding power, those that are controlling the state, are actually afraid of the population because they know that after a period of five years, the powerful press, powerful citizenship will hold them to account after five years. So these three things are key, the issue of con consensus, the issue of diversification, and the issue of uh, self-correction. Uh, but despite these things, the situation on the African continent remains bleak, remains depressing. By far, the majority of African countries are still located in category two and category three. In other words, the unfree category and the partially free uh, category. There are less than or around 10 countries that are in the, uh, in the, uh, in the free uh, category. But even those that are in the free category, you see evidence of uh, recession. You see evidence of uh, uh, reversal. Uh, Benin is a good example. Uh, for years since uh, 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 the 90s, it has endured what some hoped was an enduring uh, uh, you know, you know, democracy. Uh, but since 2014, uh, things are falling apart. In the last election just held, uh, opposition, five opposition political parties were, 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 were banned, uh, and uh, uh, parties aligned uh, to the head of state were only allowed to contest and gain uh, political power. So the critical question that really arises, and it, it, it's a question that is posed in this book, what makes other transitions stick and what makes the other transitions remain arrested, remains derailed, remains, uh, 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 you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, captured. If you look at countries that, we, that are in category uh, uh, two, uh, there are about 24 uh, countries in that category, they're partly free. Here you find a motley of different uh, states. You find countries like uh, Tanzania, uh, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, for instance, Mozambique, for instance. But these are countries that have uh, mastered the art of electoral deception. You go through a, an election for five years, uh, but, that, but that election, thanks to electoral authoritarianism, is just a pretense. So you celebrate the fact that you have held an, an election that comes once in five years, but nothing changes. And unfortunately, that has become the biggest lie on the continent. We have lowered standards by defining democracy and restricted it to elections that come uh, every five years, which the elite that run Africa have become masters of diverting and, uh, and, <coughs> and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and subjugating. Then there's, there's the third category, uh, the, 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 the category of outright uh, failure. Here you find in good company uh, countries like uh, uh, Sudan, uh, countries like uh, the South Sudan, Jibu, Gabon, my own country, uh, 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 Zimbabwe. I guess we have to put, uh, 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 you know, Mali there. These are total basket cases. These are total dogs breakfast. One which many dogs uh, wouldn't touch by a long, uh, 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 by a long mile. You have, you have uh, Rwanda also falls in that category. You have uh, stories of a, a president that wins an election by 98%. But I can guarantee you that if you took that president and members of his own close family, you wouldn't get 98%. Uh, <laughs> his children wouldn't vote for him. So the critical question then is, how do we get those countries that, we, that are in category A stick around? There are signs of uh, discohesion <laughs> in Botswana, for instance, right now as I'm talking to you. Uh, there are signs of uh, slippage in Botswana right now. So how do we make democracy stick in category <coughs> A. In category B, 
the partially free uh, countries. How do we make these countries transit to category A? But more importantly, how do we make these countries real genuine uh, democracies free of uh, electoral authoritarianism and the scepter of the electoral lie uh, that elections come after every five years uh, but, but nothing changes. Kenya is another example that falls into that category. Then you have got the toxic uh, group. Uh, and one of the key things in the toxic group, uh, category three, is the strong presence of uh, states that are dominated by liberation movements. And not just liberation movements, liberation movements that waged a bloody war for decolonization. So you find Swapo, uh, sorry, you find a, 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 a Frelimo of Mozambique uh, there. You find the MPLA uh, of, uh, of Angola there. You find uh, uh, ZANU-PF uh, of uh, Zimbabwe uh, 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 there, uh, which brings to the, the point that Greg has made that there is a huge difference on the African continent between those countries that were, uh, we use the term, born free right from the word go, and Namibia falls in that category. South Africa calls, uh, falls in that category. In other words, those countries that knew right from the word go that we needed much, much more, something much more fundamental than just lowering the Union Jack or the, the, the French uh, 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 flag. Uh, and South Africa is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a good example. Which brings me to my last point. Which brings me to my last point, the point we make in this book that when you carry out a balance sheet on the African continent, and indeed in other countries, you are battling with, uh, with the Venezuela in this part of the world, countries like Cuba uh, in this part of the world. It is what happens between the two goalposts of the previous election uh, that is so key. It is what happens between these two goalposts. So number one, do you have strong institutions that are able to hold the state to account. Strong judiciary, uh, for instance. We make reference in one of the chapters uh, to, the, to the book by uh, uh, Asame Glow and, and Robinson, uh, Why Nations, uh, Why Nations uh, uh, Fail. The idea that you have strong non-extractive non institutions is very key. And I live uh, in a country where, uh, where institutions are captured, where there's total conflation between the ruling party and the rest of the institutions in the, in the, in the state. I'm a, I'm a practicing uh, lawyer. The cases I take, which I know I'll lose just by the nature of uh, my client <coughs> or the cause of uh, action. And I'm sure if I were to speak to lawyer friends in Mozambique, in Uganda, in Angola, uh, and in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, they will tell you uh, the same thing. And speaking of the Democratic Republic of Congo, I don't know why we call it a de democratic or a republic, but it's neither, of the, it's neither of the above. So the issue of strong institutions is very important. Then number two, the issue of constitutionalism and the rule of law. And here I want to go beyond constitutions. We have constitutions in Africa. That's not the challenge. But we have constitutions without constitutionalism. So they're just written papers uh, that we lawyers love to quote different sections in it and prepare uh, strong briefs, but at the end of the day, it's just a, a, a joke. So the issue of constitutions with constitutionalism is very key. If we have to make this thing that we call democracy stick, and if we have to make these transitions genuine uh, transitions. The third thing that is so key is an empowered uh, citizenship, a citizenship that is able to protect itself and one of the things we have created in the African constitution are what are called chapter 12 uh, uh, institutions in Zimbabwe, chapter 13 institutions in South Africa, your human rights commissions, your anti-corruption uh, commissions, your gender commissions, provided that these institutions are totally independent of the states. They play a key role in monitoring power and in emasculating, uh, uh, in emasculating power. Then the fourth thing that is so important is a functional uh, economy. It's a, it's a functional, strong functional economy uh, that grows and, 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 that, and the growth is inclusive, that creates uh, jobs. One of the things that the elite in Africa used to subjugate the population is poverty. 
And many people wonder, many scholars wonder, why is it that in the poorest of poorest countries, and you find that in category three are some of the poorest of, of countries, why is, is it that in these countries there's no revolt, the, the status quo reproduces itself for years and years and for decades and decades? Uh, uh, Zaire and Mobutu Seseko is a good example. From 1966, the per capita income uh, collapsed from about US 2000 to US 180. But the people did not revolt uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo because poverty creates a patronage. The ruler, the head of state, becomes a gatekeeper uh, responsible for handing out uh, uh, patronage and goodies to a, a, a gullible uh, population. So patronage and the power retention agenda become the two engines uh, that foster you know, you know, power retention. So the issue of a, a, a growing economy, a functional economy, is so key. And once you create a functional economy, you create choices. If you grow the middle income, if you, if you grow a, a middle class, you are create, creating opportunities. The middle class wants to go on holiday. The middle class wants to have a choice of a vehicle that it drives. But once the middle class makes that decision on these key personal things, it must also make that decision on the political playing field. So the two go hand in hand. So in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, Ultimately, what makes the transition stick, what, democracy, what makes democracy stick are these key things that you won't find on election day. Uh, these key things that you won't find on the one day that comes in, 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 in five years. The question of strong institutions, the questions of constitutionalism and the rule of law, the questions of a strong market, the question of a strong uh, 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 citizenship. This is not to say the election day itself is not important. I live in a country where the election day is captured, where the electoral management system is an extension of the ruling party, zanu -PF. So I know the importance of the election day. We can't underestimate it. But the election day alone, divorced from these other things, is meaningless. I thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Uh, you've given us a lot, uh, a lot to cover uh, question-wise, and we've got about a half an hour to do that, maybe a little more. Um, let me start off by just kind of Picking up where you just left off, Tendai, if you had to uh, rank or prioritize, I guess, uh, those, those categories you just went through, uh, do you explore it all in the book, or how would you, how would you sort of frame to an audience here, sp specifically maybe even a donor audience or you know, a World Bank audience, if you're, if you're having those conversations, can you say where, uh, where you would prioritize um, assistance or uh, development in, in trying to bolster uh, the various pillars that, that underpin a democracy? Uh, uh, the states in uh, category three, uh, the, the failed states, uh, we, we make the point in the book that uh, this, it's so difficult uh, for this country to get out of the rut without external agents. We call it refereeing in the, in, in, in the book. So external agents is so important because oftentimes the population is so disempowered and it's so weak and it's so important for countries like uh, like this one uh, to support the democratization uh, uh, you know you know you know you know movement uh, to support democratic uh, you know you know institutions so i would concentrate a lot uh, on uh, on uh, on category 3 because once you make movement you create shareholders who can protect that little status quo uh, but the countries in category 3 if you look at them cameroon the cameroons of this world the zimbabweans of this world uh, complete total basket cases. Yeah. So external agents is required uh, a lot, uh, what we call refereeing in the book. So in the refereeing, I'm uh, thinking about a case like, um, like Gambia, uh, where you had a very strong ECOWAS response, you had a, a backed up by, by the AU, uh, an indigenous response as well, demanding uh, change and accountability for the for the Jame regime, I'm just curious when you look at the sort of concentric circles of 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 of, um, of refereeing, as you call it, whether it's domestic or sub-regional, regional, international, um, do they all need to be playing at the same level? Do, uh, are you finding greater efficacy if it is a sub uh, uh, sub regional uh, that takes the lead. I mean, these are these are often questions that arise when they're certainly in a crisis in a crisis moment. Zimbabwe had a similar kind of crisis moment where you had a sub regional organization. Is that the most effective place to uh, to, to to play that refereeing role? 
I think that uh, if you look at the case of the Gambia versus Zimbabwe, which we do in the book, okay. um, it's clear that uh, clearly there was a different uh, political thrust coming from ECOWAS as there has been from, from uh, SADC on Zimbabwe. Uh, and in part it's be because of what Tendai mentioned is, is you have liberation movements uh, closing ranks uh, around the issue of Zimbabwe with a different set of priorities uh, reflecting on their own domestic circumstances. Uh, and it's undoubtedly the case, uh, I think we would share this belief, we've not spoken about it, at least publicly, uh, is that you know, the international community should take or follow the lead of the, the regional organizations. They're going to be far more effective. Um, uh, unfortunately, some of the fire, and it's a shame that President de Bussinger is not with us, <coughs> some of the fire certainly went out of the AU in this regard, uh, post Mbeki, I never thought I'd say that, um, uh, Bouteflika, I certainly never thought I'd say that, uh, and post to Bus and Joe, um, that the, the, the sort of red card, yellow card system that existed, uh, and, and which made it very clear that there wasn't a coup d'etat option. You've seen that now, I think, in terms of that threat uh, um, dissipating uh, with the absence of leadership in the organization, both uh, at the executive level as well as uh, within the, the, the political domain. Um, and I think that the, the regional organizations tend to take their lead to an extent from that too. If they're not being pushed by the AU, who are they going to be pushed by? Uh, and I do think that in a greater strategic sense, China also provides uh, some, wiggle, some additional wiggle room. Um, it provides an option on questions of political systems and management, which possibly didn't exist when there was only one or two big donors in town. To pick up on on that point, um, I mean one of the one of the statistics that you that you cite in the book, and sort of to take a step back out of Africa, um, Freedom House's report, which you cite here extensively, we are now in the thirteenth consecutive year uh, of global declines in freedoms, uh, where the last year we had seventy one countries suffering declines and only thirty five registering gains. Right, so the phenomenon that you're describing in Africa is actually it, it's a global phenomenon. Right, and so when we have, I think when we talk about it in place like this, we might call these illiberal democracies, democracies that look like democracies on election day, but in a place like Hungary or the Philippines, you see a very slow and steady and deliberate um, erosion of, of rights and freedoms. How in these category two and category three countries are they viewing this global trend? Are they viewing this as, as um, as justification for the actions at home, and, and so how do we how do we support these these movements to the category one, as you call it, when we are seeing this erosion on a on a global level, and as you point out, Greg, China offering its own model, and other countries offering their own model of, of going forward. Or how how do we how do we combat that? Yeah, I think that um, the the reversal, the global reversal, uh, is, is universal, and I think that uh, one of the things that has lost uh, its bite is uh, the, the is international law and the capacity of international law uh, to hold states to account. So there's a sudden proliferation of uh, real rogue elements, you know, real tin pots that 20 years ago would not have been allowed uh, to get away with the kind of omissions and commissions uh, that are happening. So if you take, for instance, uh, you know, I want to come back to, to Africa, for instance. If you take the strong uh, involvement and strong response of both the African Union and ECOWAS during the time of uh, President Obasanjo, uh, the time of, uh, of, of, of President Wade, there are certain things now that people are getting away with. I don't think that 20 years ago, uh, uh, President Joseph Kabila would have managed to hold on to power for two years after the expiry of his uh, constitutional uh, limit. I don't think that uh, uh, President Nguru Nzinza in Burundi would have been able to play the kind of games he's been playing in the last three years if we had uh, a stronger international law uh, than uh, the present, uh, uh, than the present, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, moment. Or if there hadn't been games played in Kenya. Uh, absolutely, Kenya. Kenya is a good example. Uh, Zambia is a good example. Uh, you know, you know, the opposition. I even Benin. I spoke about uh, Benin. So there is some kind of international morality, i.e., international law, uh, that has been uh, lost 
Syria is also a good example. I could, I could give examples of this slippage that is coming from the absence of some unified global vision uh, that was codified in what I'm calling international law uh, that is gone. So tin pots are out of the, you know, the slime is out of the woodwork and, and there's no censor, there's no international censor. Uh, and, and, and look at the increase in military coups, look at the increase in uh, 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 um, constitutional amendments of the constitution. You know, people are amending constitutions to give themselves five terms, ten terms, because there's no essential in, in the national censor, and it's happening, and uh, regrettably, it's fact. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, I say this very much as a South African. You know, everyone thinks that South Africa is this fantastic role model, which... Uh, uh, was to be emulated across the world in terms of the management of diversity, in terms of constitutions, as well as constitutionalism. And it, it shows how fragile this last 10-year period, how fragile our democracy is too. And we look back on the Zuma years, and history has a, a wonderful way of sort of smoothing this all out and thinking, oh, Sir Ramaphosa was inevitable. Well, let me tell you, from the inside, he was not inevitable. It took an awful lot of civil society action, uh, um, uh, a lot of funding of those uh, institutions, very brave media and very diligent media investigations, uh, a parliament that, yes, it provided the oxygen, but also found its voice in the process. It was a bit theatrical at times, uh, but certainly helped to, to, put to, to turn the temperature up. And then a couple of very brave people, and most notably very brave people in the form of Nkubisi Jonas uh, and Pravin Gordon. And in fact, if you'd had all of those aforementioned things and not those two very brave people, I'm not so sure if we would have got out of it. Mm. It just goes to show that these things have to be worked at all the time. And I'll just tell you the very personal observation. There's my wife who uh, was detained as a student in the late 1980s and pretty much uh, I think the experience uh, scarred her. Then she married me and that scarred her further. But um, uh, she, she took our children out marching for the first time since those student marching days uh, uh, against and went and camped outside the Gupta's residence in Saxonwald in Johannesburg. And people really got off their butts and did something about it. But that's what it took. And in fact, I would say the safeguarding of democracy is not something that's left up to an ECOWAS or a, um, or a SADC, uh, God help us. Uh, um, or even a parliament of South Africa. It's a citizen's preoccupation uh, and something that you really have to sweat and work at all the time. Uh, and I'm afraid that the concern that we have overall in South Africa, last point, is if you look at our last election where uh, the turnout has gone down from 80% of, of 25 years ago to 65% now, and if you look at that against overall registration rates, now only one in four potential voters actually voted this time for the ANC. So we're now into sort of British standards of support for a government, which is probably not a place that you will. You could maybe afford to be as a, as a very mature democracy. But there is a retreat of interest from formal politics and a reversion to more violent forms, mostly, at times of political expression. Non-violent in terms of social media activism, a lot of which doesn't go anywhere, but, but increasing numbers of service delivery protests. So that sort of graph of, of voter registration and, and uh, actual uh, attendance on voting day has sort of dropped off and service delivery protests have gone up. And if you square that against a backdrop overall of increasing pressure on jobs, low sta uh, stagnating growth, low growth overall across the continent, uh, and especially in South Africa, and then there's tremendous uh, uh, demographic pressures, but increasing pressures mainly in the urban environment, it's not a, a pretty picture, uh, and one that's, that needs a few um, uh, pressure relief valves, and democracy is one of those relief valves. Uh, that sort of feeds into uh, uh, the other question that I had, going back to the, 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 the demographic trends, right? And you just sort of highlighted some of the challenges, I think, a growing population, a growing urban population is going to present. I'm wondering if you, if you all identify 
opportunities for this youth movement that's coming in Africa? Is there a way to tap into, I mean, I'm thinking of a place like Sudan today, which is experiencing a lot of, uh, a lot of tumult, but it's being driven by, largely by, by, by youth populations, uh, which in the book you cite uh, had very low levels of interest in democracy a few years ago, and here we see them essentially leading a revolution. Do you see, do you see more of this uh, in, in Africa's future as we have uh, as we have this youth bulge coming through and, and potentially demanding more, more from their governments? Yeah, uh, I think that um, we are the only continent where the population is becoming young. Yeah. And we are the fastest growing uh, continent. Uh, in 50 years' time, the population of the continent will, du will double up. Uh, in my own country, in, in just 45 years' time, uh, we will double up our population from 13 million to 26 million. Uh, the youth are 70% of uh, the population right now. That's people that are below the age of uh, 35. And one of the frightening things that we will not uh, less in this book but in, um, in making Africa work is that the parents of those children that are going to create this population implosion uh, have been born uh, now mm. yeah so so how do we create an opportunity out of this population what what economists will call the demographic uh, uh, you know you know dividend i think the first thing is to create opportunities for these young people uh, in my own country these are smart kids that you will find on on social media on instagram on on, on whatsapp on twitter I'm not sure they're still in on Facebook, but they're clever. They're clever kids, but we're not growing. the The economy is not growing to match the the population, uh, you know, you know, base. And as long as that happens, as long as uh, the population growth uh, uh, is outpaced <coughs> by the economic uh, growth, then there is inevitable implosion. Uh, there's inevitable implosion. And that's why you find that these youths are at the forefront of what is happening in uh, the Sudan at the present moment, uh, in Zimbabwe. And uh, I think that uh, if I were a Nigerian authority, I really, really uh, would, be, would, be, would be worried. Uh, so if we have to reap the democratic dividend, we have to create the necessary infrastructure. And the necessary infrastructure is uh, growing the economy, creating uh, the opportunities so that we can absorb uh, this fast-expanding uh, population. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do think that, uh, yes, the youth has tremendous energies in, 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 the, in the overall African context. Uh, there are uh, great opportunities that go with that energy, uh, but they need to be given proper opportunities for education. We spend more time discussing that and making Africa work, and that's not, not just the primary school educational part. But overall, I'd say the challenge is, uh, and this may sound a bit controversial, and, and it is a broad observation uh, and generalization, is the overall challenge is, is changing the, the political economy of Africa to a largely elite-based, boom-and-bust cycle one to something that resembles much more of a modern economy. And ostensibly what happened uh, in the transition from colonial to, to independent uh, uh, to independence across Africa was that you exchange one set of elites for the other. Mm. But the nature, the extractive nature of the economies has largely not changed. They may have big, dug deeper holes and more holes, but the nature of, of economic activity is not uh, sufficiently diversified to provide for, for all these young folk coming into the system. And I would see a future absent that sort of change of increasing frustration uh, and increasing migration, uh, both to the littoral areas from the center and north and south, but also to Europe uh, in particular, uh, and increasing violence, particularly in the, in the city areas. And, and I think the heart of it r is this issue of accountability and control. And just to, to use an Asian example, I mean, if you were to say, what's the big difference between Africa and Asia, it, it's largely it's obviously political systems and preferences, but it's also in this, in this commitment to popular welfare, 
that by and large a Asian leadership does have. It's the measurement of success uh, is in terms of, of popular welfare. Uh, and why is it the case that Asia has that is certainly worthy of, 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 a, of a much longer debate because it seems to be, and, and this is an argument that we would take forward, it, it seems to be that, in, that it takes a democratic system to drive forward that level of commitment and then constant uh, um, sort of uh, corrective action to keep on that pathway constantly. And even so, that there are very few cases of substantial change in the economic structure of the sort that we require. There are some undoubted bright spots. Kenya is, has got a, you know, an embryonic uh, digital economy. There's all sorts of bright spots across West Africa uh, and in South Africa, in spite of government largely, uh, there are some bright spots, although the ESCOM is doing its best to turn those out. Um, uh, but it, it's largely despite government, not because of it. Yeah. Well, I want to bring in uh, our audience to ask some questions. So put your hands up. We have a, a microphone over here uh, and over here. OK, so uh, we have one here and then, and then one in the back. So why don't we go over here first? Thank you. Great talk. Uh, Doug Brooks, International Stability Operations Association. And uh, I used to work for Greg. But uh, my question is actually on the African diaspora. And uh, generally, I think they're considered positive to supporting democratic uh, movements in Africa. But I just wonder how much, and is that a, a, a huge factor or a minor factor? Why don't we take a couple at a time, and, and we'll see. So there was one right here, James. Hi. Uh, Callan Love from Baobab Consulting. You uh, already mentioned a little bit about the uh, effects of the youth population shifts um, on democracy. But I was wondering about sort of the intra-African migrations. Um, that are happening, you know, uh, Ethiopia, South Africa, Nigeria are becoming large hubs of other African um, migrations. So I was interested in the effects of democracy uh, there. Okay. Two good questions. You want to? You, you want to? You want to? Okay. Okay. Hi, Phil Carter, Mihil Group. Um, related to the last one is the issue of urbanization. I've been concerned that the character of urbanization is the thread that could unravel a lot of things. Um, and I know the Brentford Foundation has been working on the African Cities Project. If you could comment on that, I mean, the dynamic that's there, because all the elements, youth, uh, interconnectivity, social services, democracy, governance, all play. And these oh. cities are growing very, very fast. So uh, your comments about the prospect of urbanization as it applies, as it, it affects uh, democracy in Africa. Well, thank you, and it's good to see you, Phil. Yeah, yeah so um, I, w I will um, pick on some and then leave uh, everything to Greg. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sign of the jet lag. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think that, uh, I think that uh, urbanization uh, is inevitable. Uh, you know that um, much of Africa is a, is a dual enclave economy. The majority of our people still live in the, in the rural areas uh, by South Africa. And in many of the countries, country like, countries like Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, Mozambique, Nigeria, as much as 80% of the people, population actually live uh, in the rural areas. Uh, so there's a drive, but there's a drive to, to urbanize. Um, uh, and, and uh, I think we make this point uh, in, in making Africa work that uh, uh, in some countries they are urbanizing at the rate of uh, you know, 250,000 people per year that are moving into, into, uh, into uh, cities. But with that comes its own challenge. Uh, the first and obvious challenge is the dwarfing or for utilities and infrastructure by this expanding population. Uh, if you go to cities like, like Lagos, if you go to cities like Nairobi, Harare, Lusaka, Harare, sorry, Lusaka, uh, 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 Maputo, there's mushrooming of uh, settlements, uh, unplanned settlements, uh, literally, uh, you know, literally, uh, you know, every day. Uh, so, so, you have uh, states that are not ready, cities that are not, uh, you know, you know, ready uh, for this huge uh, 
uh, for this uh, huge uh, you know expansion with all the contradictions that uh, you know come with it in Harare where I live one of the consequences are diseases diseases like cholera you know waterborne diseases like dysentery because the infrastructure was designed for 500,000 people and Harare now has a population uh, of 2 million, uh, two million uh, 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 people. And it goes back to the point that I make that uh, the economies must grow, uh, uh, the modern smart cities must be built. I know Greg will speak a lot about that. He does a lot of work uh, on, 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 on that. Uh, but we have to keep up uh, with the space, uh, with, the, with, sorry, with the pace of urban growth, with the pace of uh, population growth, <coughs> without that, it's an in inevitable implosion. Let me just touch uh, uh, on the diaspora. The African diaspora is a, is a huge uh, population. Uh, and oftentimes, it's a huge uh, remitter of uh, foreign uh, currency. Uh, in Zimbabwe, where I come from, we have a population of over 4 million people uh, that are in the diaspora. The majority are actually in, in South Africa. It touches on with your, with your question, the second uh, uh, person to ask the question. The majority are in the United Kingdom, Europe, and many are in the United States of America. Uh, we used to get about US $1 billion uh, from diaspora remittances, but I think that figure is uh, shrunk, and uh, one of the reasons for the shrinkage is the macroeconomic framework at home, the skewed macroeconomic framework at home. Another reason uh, for the shrinkage is, of course, that sometimes domestic countries, the countries which are generating these uh, diasporans, do not create the necessary conducive environment. They do not create a relationship with their own uh, diaspora. We do not value them enough. So in the case of Zimbabwe, the, diasp the, the, the diaspora does not have a right to vote. And it's very elementary. Why should I send in a lot of money uh, when uh, I don't have the right uh, 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 to vote? We have very archaic, very restrictive laws when it comes to, to investment. Uh, we are cruel on foreigners. We are cruel on, on locals. So when, when the diaspora want to come in and invest, there are so many barriers. Uh, that are uh, raised against uh, uh, you know, the same. In 2012, 2011, thousands of Zimbabweans we actually went back home, but they left uh, so soon after. There, there was great hope that Morgan Changirai would, would, would take over. That never happened. Uh, part of the reason is that you, you send you, your children are born in a place like this one, and you go back home, the infrastructure is, uh, is, uh, is uh, prehistoric and so forth. So I think the diaspora is a useful reserve uh, for Africa, but Africa must create the necessary conducive, the necessary relationship with that uh, diaspora, a relationship which is not ex extractive, <laughs> i.e. you are expecting uh, remittances to flow from, from one year, from one, from one venue uh, to, the, to the continent, a relationship in which uh, these diasporans are recognized and respected as equal citizens with rights uh, that are the same uh, as the normal uh, population, and that is easier said than done. Um, thanks, thanks very much. I'll, I'll try and pick up on a couple of those things. Um, it's very nice to see you, Doug and, and Phil, again. Um, I mean, I, I think African cities provide this great opportunity. Uh, it's said that 80% of the billion extra people that will be in our societies in the next 35 years, sorry, 25 years, are going to be located in urban environments. Um, we'll see if they can be. But uh, uh, the question is really, are we going to be able to prepare for it properly? And that then raises questions about, really at its core, to boil the argument down, is it raises questions of funding and authority and control. And until now, largely cities depend on stipends handed down by the central government and have only very limited means through rates and taxes, and I'm taking a broad swath again, to raise funding for their own development. And it depends on, in other words, political devolution. And in fact, uh, a sub-theme running through this book is, 
is questions of, of political decentralization of authority, uh, in both in t at the federal level, and you see this very much in the case of Ethiopia, of course, as to how that's going to play out on this continuous tension between center and region, which has now almost reversed itself over the last two years. Um, and then at, this, at this, 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 the city uh, versus the center region about uh, funding authority. Uh, um, uh, and I in the work that we have done elsewhere, and uh, we've taken a fairly disparate group of cities, probably too disparate, some successes and some failures. Uh, we're currently finishing up our work in Mombasa, uh, given its impact on the entire East African region. Uh, but to take two examples, even in South Africa, East London, where we've worked extensively in Cape Town, I mean, one is a relative success, albeit with very big problems in dealing with the, the long-term structural uh, legacies and inequalities of apartheid, Cape Town, but nonetheless pretty well organized. And one is hopelessly badly organized and hopelessly fraught with int intra-party divisions, which is Buffalo City, East London, uh, and, and really with, with even perhaps greater resources at its disposal has done extremely poorly. The difference is down to, to leadership, the difference is down to planning and, and, and the quality of political institutions and the, to some extent the selflessness of the individuals involved. But yes, cities are where the rubber is going to hit the road. Um, and it's where the rubber is hitting the road, but the roads are very badly potholed uh, um, uh, in many cases. But at you know, the extreme levels, Lagos, it's a difficult place to start. I mean, it's got the highest rate of, of, of semigration uh, in the world of any city. Nearly 100 people every hour are, are entering into Lagos. Uh, um, uh, it's, and, and we've worked extensively with the governor until he was removed. So that really, that didn't go particularly far. Uh, um, uh, and came up with some some ideas around transportation and electrification, all of which were really dependent to some extent, particularly electrification on decentralization. And then there's another extreme working in places like Hargeisa, which are really about the fundamentals and the sort of fundamental building blocks of you know, finding money for roads, finding money for, for sanitation and sewerage and so on. But cities offer economies of scale and the delivery of services and the congregation of people that should make them very exciting places for development. But we've got to get some of the basics right. Uh, and the basics are, again, which is the, the central part of this book, about getting the politics right, because that's about the way in which you get the cash right and the cash flow is correct. On the issue of, of um, just a comment on, on the issue of, of intra-African migration. You know, if you look at a country like Malawi, which has just had this infamous TIPEX election, uh, there's always something new. Um, you know, Malawi had, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, maybe 100,000 now, 3.5 million people at independence uh, um, 55 years ago. Uh, it has uh, 18 million people, person population today, uh, and it's on track to have 45 million people by 2045. Uh, and there's no way of accommodating them in a subsistence-based agricultural economy, which is Malawi, which with, with a very small sort of uh, meniscus of commercial agriculture in the form of tobacco, which is probably not a long uh, a growth industry for obvious reasons. So, so where are the extra 30, 40 million Malawians going to go? Uh, they're going to go probably mostly south. Uh, and that already in South Africa, without sounding like a doomsayer, uh, creates all sorts of tensions uh, in an economy itself which is not growing <coughs> and which, as Tendai has, has pointed out, is filled with three million, actually to our economy overall, quite beneficial, the presence of 300, sorry, three million Zimbabweans in the South African economy, many of them highly skilled uh, and underpaid. Uh, um, but th to accommodate further millions of people in addition to our own is going to create really high levels of stress and, and given histories of xenophobia across the region, uh, it, it raises all sorts of possibilities of, of violent reaction. So there's, there's sort of two things you have to think about. Phil's point, which is what we call semigration, in internal movement of people, very high in areas of South Africa, my own country as I've said, 
uh, and then there's this, 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 this shift between countries, much of it illegal, uh, much of it dependent on a breakdown in governance in the recipient country, uh, and further corrodes the government, albeit that the migrants tend to make a very above average contribution to the economy. But it is the kind of melding of new African identities, and I think there's one very sort of abstract question here, which is what is that identity going to be in Southern Africa given the percolation of, of populations over the next generation? Are we going to develop less of a Zimbabwean identity and a South African identity or Malawian identity to more one of, 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 uh, of regions uh, or, or class-based, uh, opportunity-based uh, institutions? Or are we going to revert to more prosaic uh, uh, racial and tribal identities in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, out of a, a fight for survival. So, I mean, they are big questions, but they are certainly part of the political mix. But it, the, the, you're dead right. Cities are, 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 are going to be the site of much, where much of these struggles and tensions and futures are played out. I'm conscious of the fact that we are right at the end of our time. Um, but you all are going to be sticking around a little bit afterwards, yeah. and we'll be able to continue maybe a little more of an informal conversation. I want to get to uh, our kind of closing, uh, and not and not forget that uh, that we have a, a special treat for everyone here at the end. Um, and so please do stick around, and 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 our guests will be able to to follow up with some questions offline. Um, so why don't you all just join me real quick in thanking them for, for being here and for launching this book. And I'll invite you to the stage, Robin. Yep. Yeah, OK. So a lot of people say to us, um, so you write books. Uh, young people are never going to read books anymore. I mean, I have teenagers. Uh, they don't read a lot. They read their phones. So you don't listen to us. Uh, so um, a few years ago, uh, we uh, are we going to down on there? We're going to go up here. We can come up here. Uh, we uh, we did some work with uh, Johnny Clegg, uh, and then I, I met Robin in a bar, of course, and um, we we put together a few songs over the last few years. Uh, we can play one or two for you. What do you prefer? Oh, we'll play one. <laughs> so I can see in your faces. Um, we'll play two if you really want us to. Um, and uh, so we'll, uh, we'll just do the second one first. OK. Um, uh, Robin's uh, had a whole bunch of uh, number one hits in South Africa. He's very well known. Uh, Singer songwriter, what in the tradition of Neil Young, I guess you'd say? So yeah, all sorts, yeah. I'd, I'd just like to say for the record that usually when we tour West Africa, Greg's dressed like me and I'm dressed like him. <laughs> so I don't know why it's worked out differently today, but that's the way it is. Well, it's washing, but I thought I had to wear a tie. <laughs> so this one's called Use It or Lose It, uh, and you'll hear <laughs> some lines from Mandela throughout the song. But it's about, it's urging the youth to vote, to use their vote wisely. And we ran a song competition as part of this book when we launched across West Africa and had over 100 entries, uh, which was actually judged by Johnny Clegg. And at various of the launches, we had some of the, the singers come and play for us. It was a great thing to do and encourage some of those youth who are otherwise not particularly interested uh, in democracy. So this is a little bit of slightly left field. And my 17-year-old daughter said to me, you're only doing this to embarrass me, Dad. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, 
Use it or lose it is what we say. Use it or lose it for a better day. Long walk to freedom, a long wait in that queue. Stand by me, I'll stand by you. That tree your parents planted, many a sacrifice. Don't take your vote for granted, or oh, they paid a heavy price. They look to you now, you who made the call. Don't betray them, or yourself along. Oh, yeah. Use it or lose it. Is what we say. Use it or lose it for a better day. Long walk to freedom, a long wait in that queue. Stand by me, I'll stand by you. Emancipate yourselves, as money said. Seek your redemption and don't be late. Have no fear, all hands together. To the battle chase, we'll never surrender. Oh, yeah. Use it or lose it. Is what we say. Use it or lose it for a better day. Long walk to freedom, long wait in that queue. Stand by me, I'll stand by you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.